All right. Getting a few people logging in. Uh, we are going to be in chapter two today of Second Timothy. And so a lot of there's a lot of uh, really good content in there. Um, a lot of encouraging, encouraging thoughts in there. And so uh, I'm excited about it and hopefully we'll be able to have some discussion time as well. So before we before we dive in to Second Timothy chapter two, let's go ahead and and um, start our class off with prayer and ask God to bless our our time together. Um, Father, I thank you uh, for each and every uh, participant that is here now that is uh, going to be watching this later, and I pray that you are honored through our conversation, that the um, that your word shines through. For it is, uh, it is transformational and living and active. I ask that our conversation um, be filled with grace and that it be um, uplifting and encouraging. Um, yeah, if it needs to be challenging, then let it be that as well. Um, I thank you for your word and for this moment that we have together. And we thank you, and we give you the honor and the praise, and it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. All right. So, chapter Timothy, uh, ch ch second Timothy, sorry, chapter Timothy, second Timothy, chapter one, ended by Paul talking about um, those uh, feeling feeling uh, basically alone. That. Um, those in the province of Asia have let have um, deserted him, and then um, he talks about an individual that has been faithful and that actually faithfully searched for him and searched until he found him. And and so I think it's important to remember that as we get into to chapter two because it, it makes verse one make more sense whenever we remember that that's how chapter one ended. And so as we get in here into um, into Second Timothy uh, chapter one, uh, at the end of chapter one, um, you know very well um, he's talking about his uh, his his friend that I had trouble pronouncing his name, and that brother <laughs> brother Kirk Senior helped with. Now you're you might have to do it again, Onessa Forrest. Is that correct? Um, so he's talking about him and how he how he was a help to him in in Ephesus, and he says, "You know very well, in how many ways he helps me in Ephesus." And then he gets to chapter, um, what we have is chapter two. And um, I apologize, I don't have it uh, on the screen for you tonight. Um, it's been a, a a crazy week at at work, and so I just didn't I wasn't able to make the full PowerPoint presentation like I had hoped to. Um, but this gives us opportunity to um, to read it, and and hopefully you have it in in um, maybe some different versions, and we can discuss those. Chapter uh, chapter two, verse one. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. Um, I'll go ahead and I'm going to read through verse 13. So verse 8. Remember, Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. 
And therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here is a trustworthy saying, if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. All right. So those are the, the first 13 verses there, and we'll we'll read the, the rest of it in, in just a little bit. But he, he goes out here and he's telling him, you, Timothy, my beloved son, be strong in the grace that is in that is in Christ Jesus. I love the um, the personal um, the personal sentiment that's in this. That the, how personal this letter is. Um, you then, my dear son, my my child. He's inviting Timothy, his beloved child, to a dangerous mission, actually, um, and trusting him with a great responsibility. Timothy's going to visit Paul, his, his mentor. At least that's what he's asking him to do. And he's been, uh, Paul's been imprisoned. And this imprisonment is different than any other that he's had. This one, it seems Paul knows that this is going to be his, his last imprisonment. Um, he's awaiting his, uh, his execution. And he wants Timothy to come and, and visit him. Timothy is Paul's beloved spiritual son. He's um, here. We see Paul kind of he's going to give him this, this fatherly advice. Paul is qualified to do this because Paul himself endured suffering. So whenever he tells him to um, endure suffering, Paul understands what that's like. Um, we see uh, we see Paul um, all throughout Acts enduring affliction after affliction all over the Mediterranean world. And how did Paul endure? Well, the same way that he's telling Timothy to endure. And that is by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. By the, by the grace, the, the, the gift that is in Christ Jesus, the grace. Timothy is going to have to be strong. He's going to have to, uh, if, he's, if he's going to accomplish this, he's got to be strong. He's got to endure hardship. Timothy, um, Timothy, we 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 know from reading all of all of Timothy that he he struggles a little bit. He struggles with some with some timidness, some some fear, uh, timidity. He, um, he he probably struggles with. Um, with feeling like he's young, maybe even unqualified. But Paul has reminded him in a previous letter and in this letter that God has, um, that I'm entrusting you with this, which God has entrusted to me. Timothy is going to have to learn to endure. Uh, he's going to endure by the grace of Christ, by the strength of Christ. Um, he's going to have to be strong if he's going to risk going to join Paul in Rome. Grace has more than just a, a, a forgiveness of sins to it. it grace is, is the strength that's needed. Um, I, now, the word, the word grace um, is, is charis. Um, it can also be translated gift. If you recall, in, in chapter 1, he tells them to, to fan the flame of the gift given you. Um, and here, um, be strong in the gift that is in Christ Jesus or in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So it has, has more to do with, with than just, you know, God was gracious and he forgave my sins. Um, and, and so it's a... And I, and I love that idea of, of gift because it, it continuously reminds us it's not something we're going to earn. It's not something we can accomplish on our own. It's a gift. Um, and, and that's the strength that's going to be given him. Even the strength that's given Timothy to endure is a gift from, from Christ. 
So with Timothy, this this guy that's uh, seemingly fragile, is gonna was gonna last in Ephesus, this city with uh, with blatant heresy, this this uh, city that has widespread disbelief, this um, this difficult church <laughs> that he's at. It's gonna have to be by the gift, by the grace of Jesus Christ, by the strength that only Christ can give. And for us, for those of us who uh, who want to make an internal, an eternal difference in this world, we have to rely on God's strength and not our own. The people that make a difference in the kingdom are those that rely upon God's strength, not those that are relying on their own strength. And um, I like I like the story of um, someone was speaking with with um, Charles Spurgeon and he was asked, how do you accomplish the things that you do, all the work that you have to do in just one typical day? And I love Spurgeon's response. He said, you forget there's two of us. So you, he, he, he acknowledged that it's not by his own strength, not by his own um, abilities, but it's the grace it's the strength that comes from uh, from Christ. We, <laughs> like Timothy, like Paul, we cannot possibly live apart from his strength. The gospel message is, is one that we need to be, I believe, meditating on daily. Because we can never outgrow it, our need for it, our need for it. Never, never disappears, never dissipates, never goes away. And so we've got to be men and women that are diligent about relying upon the strength of Christ, his, his strength, his character. That's the only way we're going to make it. Um, he continues on. He says, the things that you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses in trust and trust those to reliable men that will be able to um, qualify to teach others also. This faithfulness that, that Paul has um, been teaching, it's been tested. It's been tested by, by the witnesses. It's been um, considered worthy to be accepted, and it's worth passing on to Timothy. God gave that message, or Christ gave that message to Paul. Paul didn't make it up. He was given this message. It was entrusted to him through divine revelation. It's not it's not some human invention that Paul just said, you know, I, I think these are important things. Let me go all around the known world and, and let me start teaching these things. No, he's he's been entrusted this message. And now he is um, he has entrusted that to Timothy and he's telling Timothy entrust that to others. Timothy's been left um, by Paul in Ephesus to deal with false teachers and to guard the faithful teaching of God's word. And, and now he's going to be leaving for Rome to go visit his, uh, his mentor, Paul. And others will carry on the work. He was to entrust that message that deposited the gospel to other faithful, reliable men. Just as God entrusted it to Paul and Paul entrusted it to Timothy, now Timothy is to entrust it to others. What you heard from me. What you heard from me. Pass on. Entrust to others. Um. I'm sure you, uh, I believe this was in our notes that, that I sent out, but we, um, if you, if you are in, in a ministry field, ministry related field, um, we have the duty to pass and entrust that message on, um, to, to raise up leaders, to, to find, um, those Timothys in the faith that are going to be um, carrying on the message and the work and the ministry. Um, and, and we don't look at the externals. 
we look at the spiritual aspects. Because a, a person could be a great public speaker, but if they aren't a person of, of dedication and prayer and, and strong spiritual, um, strong relationship with Christ, that's not the person that we need to entrust. Um, we want to entrust it to, to those that are faithful, reliable. Very, uh, and, and I just, I just love that, um, that element, that aspect um, of don't let, don't let the message die with you. Don't let that message die with, with you. Entrust it. Pass it on. Um, let's see. Yes, Kirk. Sorry. Daniel, Henry. thank you for entrusting this to us. I, I, I don't know if you thought about that or not, but w we appreciate the work that you're doing because that's, this is exactly what you're doing in St. Timothy 2.2. 2. And my story is I had a school. I called it the Ridgecrest School of Evangelism. Yeah. And we had people gathering from all over Oklahoma City, and we had about 30 or so at one time and other, other times, not so many, but a guy came to class and he said, Kirk, I, I want you to let me teach in your school. I said, no, you can't teach in my school. Oh, he got kind of upset with me. And I said, you go back to your church and you form yeah. the school of evangelism there. I don't want you coming. I don't mind you coming to this class. I want you to come to my class. And I'm very honored. But I said, you you would do more good if you would stay home and pick out faithful men like Paul did and told Timothy to do and teach yes. those guys. Everywhere a guy goes, everywhere a person goes that's been to SHBI and he's to open up a school. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yes, very good. And that's and that's what we're we're called to do, to entrust it. Um, thank you for for saying that. That was, and that's how we live it out. Um, and that takes um, it, within like our our local congregations. Maybe that takes it, it takes a lot of effort for one to 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 find those people. So it means that we have to kind of get our hands dirty we have to we have to spend time with with uh with people we have to if we're going to raise up a timothy then we've got to have that person that um that we take with us that we invest in that we are vulnerable with and that we that we share our our victories and our challenges and our defeats and and our and our our learning and and understanding that that a lot of that learning takes place through the suffering, and and through those things, it, it it's a it's an investment, you know. Um, I love the to go and and speak somewhere, you know, like, uh, and and it and it does something to me whenever I'm I'm speaking to a large crowd, and I and I see people in there kind of, and I can look at their eyes, and I can see if they're responding, but that's not. That's not where this uh, that that's a good way to to impart a teaching. But the real work comes when when I'm with this person and they're seeing me and how I deal with my family or they're seeing me and how I deal with difficult situations or or something that seems so minute, so insignificant that that challenges me or or that frustrates me i've been able here's a here's a moment of vulnerability for you okay i can handle when big things happen a lot easier than all the little small things all the uh all the daily interruptions those frustrate me the um you know somebody uh, something as simple as as getting cut off in traffic you know and i don't live in a big city or anything I, um 40,000 people in my town that I live in right now. But those things frustrate me. And what if 
how, how do how do I respond in those simple things, in those small things? Because what does Jesus say? If you're if you're faithful with little, you can be trusted with much. And, and so the day-to-day activities, the, the major things, the small things, I've got to get be willing to get my hands dirty, to get a little uncomfortable, to let that person ask questions. And to be able to say, for them to say to me, how do you think you handled that? And for me to be honest, even when I didn't handle it the way that I thought I, looking back, that I should. Uh, that that getting your, your hands dirty kind of thing is, is, an, is an important element. And, and so we have a message that we must proclaim and that we must, uh, I believe, entrust to others. But especially as we're able to, in a local setting, how much time are we investing in that? How much time are we spending with with the the, the young Timothys? Uh, I'm just going to keep using that phrase. With with the Timothy that that there's so much potential in, and that God's going to use to do big things in the kingdom. We've got to have that. Um, like, for example, uh, I don't even know. I know the name Billy Graham, but I don't know the man that 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 taught Billy Graham about Jesus. Who who was that? You know, see, and and what I'm saying there is, I mean, whether you agree or you don't agree or or whatever, we oftentimes will will think of of ourselves maybe as insignificant or maybe too highly, <laughs> more highly than we ought. Paul guarded against, said to guard against that as well. And, and so we've got people that are watching us. And, and so some are watching us to see if we're going to fail. And, and others are watching us to see how we respond and are watching to see if we see something in them. At that little spark of, of hope that says, I see a leader in there. I see a Timothy in there. I, I see a person in there that, that's going to that's gonna do big things in the kingdom. That's the person I want to, to entrust to a, to a place like Ephesus. Um, so that's, uh, I guess that's a little soapbox that I got onto there. Yes, sir, Kirk. Stay on oh, it. Kirk. <laughs> stay stay <laughs> on it. Um one of the one of the things that that I think sometimes people forget when you do personal evangelism is that you're not only you're not only commanded by Jesus to baptize people, lead them to Christ, but you are commanded also to teach them all things whatsoever yeah. I've commanded you. Tw- Acts twenty eight twenty, and mm-hmm. and it's the same thing here. Uh, when you when you go through the how to, how to become a Christian, how to live a faithful Christian life. You plant that seed. You plant that seed. You're obligated not only to commission in the Great Commission to, to teach and baptize people, but to teach those people that you baptize in such a way that they will duplicate your effort. Yeah. It is a marvelous ministry to step back. And five years after you've taught somebody and led them to Jesus, they come back to you and say, guess what, Daniel? I baptized five people. I led five people to Christ. Yes. Praise the Lord. Praise the <laughs> Lord. That that is oh wow. That is such a thrill to have your to have your little babies to come back and tell you that they've led people to Jesus. It is so thrilling. Amen. Definitely. Yes. And if we if we have that mind of Christ, and then we're going to we're going to be regularly, I believe, bringing up um, leaders, making disciples, because that that's that's the commission he gave us, right? Uh, go uh, as this is any you know the the great commission. Go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He should obey all that I've commanded, right? That, and he, he for once says, baptize disciples. 
So that's that's got to be some some work that's put into that, and in the con, in the continuation of teaching. And so yes, we've got to be uh, people that are that are about that. Um, and and so that's that's so significant. We uh, those that are younger need need our experience. They need our wisdom. They need our insight. And perhaps we need their energy. We need we need people that are that are going to be um, energetic and pumped up and, and full of of a passion. I love seeing whenever a new person comes to Christ, and that excitement that they have. And and oftentimes, I would say to the church, but I'm just going to say myself. Okay, I have not done a good job. Of, of continuing to, to invest in that individual. My job isn't, isn't to, to um, my responsibility or my call isn't just to get somebody to, to accept Christ and be baptized and then just to, just to leave them to fend for themselves. No, that's a newborn babe. They need someone now more than ever. They need a person that's going to be with them. That's going to, to, uh, be a mentor to them. That's that's going to be there when the trials come and the suffering come because we know it's coming. And and so often we uh, we neglect that part, and then we go back and 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 we see the person and and they've lost that zeal, they've lost that passion, they've lost that fire, and we have, I believe, a, a responsibility to continue. To, to spend time with, to invest in people. And, and so that's, that's definitely needed. And, and we see that in Paul's ministry, um, especially in his dealings with, with Timothy and, and Titus. Mentoring, it's a, a disciple making, whatever you want to call that. It's about relationships. And, and so we struggle with it at times because it requires time and it requires vulnerability. It requires trust. We, uh, and, and the acceptance of the fact that inevitably somebody along the way is going to hurt you. It's, uh, it, it's, it's messy. Ministry is a, a messy thing because we're, we're, we're dealing with people that are lost and broken, but we've got to find the time, make the time, uh, it's got to be the priority to, to, to lead, to evangelize, to, to mentor, to disciple, to raise up the next young Timothy. And, and so that's uh, a responsibility that we have. Um, and, and I realize I'm, I'm just on verse two. So um, talked a long time on that, but I, I believe it is of so much importance. Endure hardship or join with me in suffering. I, um, Paul, um, and he says, endure hardship like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Paul's guarded by Roman soldiers. He knows what that's like. Um, and, and so they're in, there's a spiritual war that we're in. And Paul talks about it, Ephesians 6. Our battle's not against flesh and blood, and, and we're in this, uh, this this spiritual war. And hardship and suffering, those are a part of war. Paul's sitting here writing this, about to be executed. He's been persecuted. He's been he's been left for dead. He's been shipwrecked. Paul's lived life. He's suffered. He's endured hardship. And Timothy, Timothy's got to be prepared. Be prepared to endure. I mean, he, he seems to have done a good job so far, but but the trials don't end. They keep coming. 
the, the suffering keeps coming, the, the hardships keep coming. Endure those. Endure those, Timothy. And Paul's qualified to talk about this, to encourage Timothy, because Paul remained faithful through all of those sufferings. He's got a, a Timothy has a great example in, in Paul. He has a great, a great mentor to lead him, to guide him, to encourage him. So when Timothy is, is suffering or he's enduring something, and, and Paul says, oh, you, you can do this by the strength and the grace and the gift that Christ gives you. Paul knows it because he's lived it. Faithfulness requires discipline. And, and so Paul uses these illustrations of a, uh, of, a, of a soldier, of an athlete, of a farmer. And he says that no one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. He has a job that he has to be free to do. And then he, he talks about, and, and we're going to talk about these uh, a little more, just introducing them right now. And then Paul um, uses uh, the illustration of an athlete and the discipline that's needed to be an athlete. Um, he doesn't win the crown unless he competes according to the rules. He's got to give up things to maintain his training um, my son, uh, he runs track in college and, uh, and, and I see him, you know, when it, when his friends are all, um, having to, uh, around here in this part of, of, of the country, we like our Dr. Pepper and I, and I'll see him around his friends and they're all drinking the Dr. Pepper and, and he's got the water. He's, he's willing to sacrifice those things because he's training. He knows what he wants to do. He's got a goal in mind. He's got his eyes on the finish line. And so he's able to, to practice discipline. An athlete needs discipline. You don't take shortcuts. You, you, you don't get off track. You don't step into the other lane. Um, he, Paul talks about a hardworking farmer. Um, it, that's not a, anything anything glamorous about that. There's, there's hard work involved. Every serious occupation requires self-discipline, sacrifice, hard work. And Timothy's got to be willing to do those things in order to fulfill the ministry that he's called to. This uh, soldier, endure like a soldier. Paul's familiar with soldiers. <laughs> he's in prison multiple times. And he's guarded by soldiers. And a good soldier is focused. A good soldier is, is willing to suffer. And he's telling Timothy, you endure that hardship. He, he doesn't tell him, get mad at the hardship or quit when it gets hard or don't expect it to get hard. Suffering and hardship are a part of the Christian life. Christ has called us to a life. Uh, he's not called us, I should say, he has not called us to a life of ease, but rather a life of endurance. By the grace that's in Christ Jesus, we can endure. Um, don't get distracted. Don't let, the, don't let the good things keep you from doing the main things. There are a lot of things that vie for our attention. There are a lot of things that can, that can distract us. There are a lot of civilian affairs that we can get involved in. But a good soldier is there to please the commanding officer. And that's what Paul is, um, that's one of the, the illustrations that Paul uses. You're there to, to do the job. You're, you're there to, 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 to fight and to suffer for the cause that the commanding officer has given you. They, uh, they take that job seriously. Um, it was, uh, Augustine or Augustine, depending on how you would like to pronounce that. Um, the love, he said, the love of worldly possessions entangles the soul and keeps it from flying to God. We can get caught up in, in things that, that aren't bad, 
but they take our focus off what's good, what's right, the main, the main objective, if you will. And so he says, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. And then he talks about an athlete. Now, Paul, if you recall, Paul was a was a tent maker. And perhaps that occup that that work had him be around the Greek games at times. And he doesn't he doesn't point out like a particular sport. I know in other ones he's, he talks about, you know, a runner competing for a prize. But in this one, he just says an athlete. And he, and he uses it to make his point, I believe, about discipline. The athlete must compete according to the rules in order to win the crown. To train them. Uh, he, he told Timothy in his first letter, train yourself in godliness. There's no shortcuts. It requires discipline. And we do this by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. If athletes train and they compete for the applause of man and for trophies that fade away, then how much more should we train for that which is eternal, for the crown that doesn't fade? Discipline, focus, those things are needed. And he talks about a farmer, um, just like uh, just like soldiers and athletes. Farmers, they they really can't take any shortcuts. There's nothing uh, nothing necessarily uh, glorious or exciting about farming. Um, there's there's typically no applause. I have never seen a a post game press conference. Where a farmer planted, you know, hey, I, I scattered some seed today. I tilled the field today. There's nothing there that that necessarily comes across as exciting or or, or glorious in the ways of men. But it's a vital occupation, right? It's a vital task. It's desperately needed. In fact, um, imagine if we didn't have farmers today. Most of us. In the states, we don't even, we wouldn't be able to get our food because we're not. We, you know, we think uh, when I when I start talking to my kids about you know where does food come from and everything, they're like the grocery store, and and that's probably the mindset that many people have. The uh, the work of the farmer is necessary, but it's not always glamorous. It involves sowing and planting and plowing and monitoring. It's a, it's constant work. The farmer wakes up early. He he works the fields. He he cares for the animals and sometimes has to shoot the wolves that are coming to attack. He's dedicated to his work. And so, as I'm reading this and Paul's encouraging Timothy in these things, I see. That what he's calling him to is not for the faint of heart. This, this role of ministry that, that Timothy has, that Paul has called him to, it's tough. And, and people like to, like to joke about ministers, you know, oh, you only work one day a week. Or, or the rest of the week, you're just out eating with people. And I... Not even knowing the amount of of work that goes into this, the the ministry, the um, think of the the tears that are shed over people. Um, there's there's times in my own in my own ministry where I wake up in the middle of the night crying over someone that I had a, over a conversation that I had that day of of somebody who's hurting and and struggling, and and wondering how they're going to go on with with life. And you're trying your best to show them the hope of Jesus. 
it's important work. If you are a, a person that is ministering to others, you are doing an important work that shouldn't be taken lightly. And, uh, and I'm not just talking about a, uh, a person who, who works, you know, who has a, who has a pulpit or, or is a youth minister or, or is, has the office of, of elder or deacon. But if you are involved in the life of people, you are doing ministry and it's not something to be taken lightly. And he tells, <clears throat> any thoughts so far before we, we go on here? I just, I want to open that up. I, I know I've, I've talked a lot. And so I want to give opportunity if anybody has, has any thoughts. Uh, I'd like to say something. This is Tyree Hunter. It's okay, so ahead, true. Tyree. It's so true. Ministry isn't just behind the pulpit. If you're involved with people, you care. Okay. And it's not easy to be willing to be woke up at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> it, it's not a life of convenience at all. And uh, when that, that could say they don't, people don't know what goes behind this. I'm not a pastor. Anymore. I mean, even being a ministry in ministry and caring for people, um, I care. And when you care, yeah. it's not easy. Uh, it's not easy uh, because people are on your heart. And so I just wanted to com comment on on that 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 you just made. Go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Mm -hmm. Any anyone else? Yes, uh, I would like to comment. Um, one of the things I like, this is Stephen. Uh, uh, one of the things uh, I probably got, I probably was able to connect tonight. So. Uh, one of the things that uh, I love about this letter uh, that um, Paul, Paul wrote to is the seriousness of behind being in ministry. Uh, it kind of, it, 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 it speaks to me with volumes in the um, new role that I'm in and it's seeing the, the people uh, want your attention at all times. Uh, they're they'll come around even when you're talking with someone. They uh, uh they're gonna come around you and uh, they want your time. So you have to be dedicated because and and I like what Miss Terry said. It is not a a a a, a uh, comfortable or a uh, what I would say a easy going uh thing to do because uh, if you turn away from someone, they'll feel that you didn't pay full attention to them. So it's definitely is a balance. But the seriousness behind the studying, uh, behind the uh, uh, the responsibilities that you have to make sure that, uh, uh, and I try not to uh, get so so uh, deep into the word with them because you'll lose them sometime as well. So the, the, the discerning spirit that, uh, uh, that you have to have. But I really love this letter because Paul is talking with him, but he said, he's telling all of us, this is serious, but lives are at stake. Lives yeah. are at stake. Uh, and, and if we take it lightly, uh, uh, things that we might say and harm them, uh, hurt their fate. So we have to be on point at any time we're getting ready to represent God's word. I just wanted to say that. Yeah, very good. This is Cornell. Uh, I made it, by the way. <laughs> yes, yeah, good. Um, I've been traveling, so please play for our family while we're traveling. But um, mm -hmm. this scripture just might, reminds me of the weight of the ministry. Um, I remember shortly after I uh, became a minister, I was able to witness to a young man, pray with him. But I never um, got the. I never took the opportunity to to um, to um, ask the confession of faith, and um, I drove away and um, tried to. Uh, God convicted me of it, and I tried to drive back and go find him. To, uh, <laughs> and the uh, the sad part of the story is that uh, he didn't make it that night. 
I went to the job site the next day and found out that he died on the way home. Mm. Um, and that weighed heavily on me that I missed the opportunity, even if I prayed with them and shared uh, the gospel with them and all those things, but just never asked him uh, to give his life and all of that. Um, just because uh, I looked at the time and how much time I had spent with them. I was on the clock and I was like feeling bad that I'm on the clock giving the gospel. Um, and I left without that last dot and I crossing the teeth. And um, hmm. that weighed heavily on me for years. And this just reminded me of that weight that I read. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Kirk. Go ahead, Kirk. And let's stop all this. Let's don't have any more talking about, like somebody might say, well, all I had was a few courses at South Houston Bible Institute. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> listen, listen, you have a great opportunity in this school, but if you never had this school, that doesn't alleviate the responsibility. But since you've gone to the school, too much is given, much is required. And so if you're if you're taking this class and you think, well, I got my credits, so I'm done. You you don't get what's happening at this po point. Mm -hmm. You 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 don't have to get your doctor's degree or your master's degree or go to a Bible college or anything like that. When you become a Christian, you open up a school. You become the professor, one on one. You educate, as the old boy said. <laughs> you you have that responsibility to not only baptize them, bring them to Christ but also teach them, and and you're the professor. You don't need a master's degree to do that or a doctorate. Somebody said, well, I'm going to get my, I want to get my doctor's degree and teach at a Christian school. No, 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 no. No, we start discipling when when we become Christians. Yeah. And you say, well, I don't have a degree. You don't need a degree. Just teach them the word of God and yes. pray for them and walk with them like you've been talking Tonight, Daniels. Excellent stuff. Excellent. Excellent. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Emmanuel, go ahead. Yes. Um, I'll just I'll just like to ask, what's the best way? It sounds like there's a heavy burden on on the shoulders, responsibility to to care past past the people. For example, with the with this sasso we just heard, and for you that about two a.m. at night, what's the best way to be able to cope with this type of um, burden? Um, one thing that that is powerful to me is um. It's in. It's actually in this chapter. Uh, let me let me find it in here. Um, verse nine. Paul says, uh, and that is uh, that's why I'm suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Um, when I have those moments where I'm waking up at at 2 a.m. with this burden. It might be an instance where I can't do anything physically for that person at that moment. But it, I can do something powerful for that person and I can pray. And I can, I can ask God that his word will prevail. And I, and I love this, uh, this, this verse. I've got a, I've got a bunch of stuff to talk about on it. But that that burden that we have that maybe it's a maybe it's a it's a burden where where I have to get up and I have to go find that person. But sometimes I that's not possible. But I I can pray. I, I can I can pray for that person and I can I can say, God, show me where they're at or or work in this situation um you know what's going on in their heart they 
this is an opportunity for us. And and look, I also have to have time where I'm making sure that my own soul is being my own self is being cared for. That's important as well, because mm -hmm. if I'm not if I'm not um, disciplined and I'm not working at my own spiritual life, I'm not I'm not spending time with God just because of of my own personal relationship with him, then I'm not going to be an effective minister to others. And so. Um, what I hope you don't hear me saying is that invest all in others and and never worry about your own spirituality, because um, we are called to to make disciples and, and to minister and, and to and to baptize. But we also are to look after our hearts and, and make sure that we are spending time with God. Um you know, I, I love the psalm says, I've hidden your word in, in my heart that it may not sin against you. Uh, Galatians 6, Paul talks about carrying each other's burdens. And then a, a few verses later, he says, but each one must carry their own load. So I, I wrestle with that all the time because I'm like, well, which one is it, Paul? And, and I believe you see, he would tell me the answer is yes. Carry one another's burdens, but ultimately the burden that I have to carry is, is, is mine. I, I have, I have to, to make sure that my life, my, my focus, my, my time, my prayers are, are in order. And then I'm looking at my, I'm letting the scripture examine my heart because when that starts to take place, then I can see the areas in my life that I've got to, um, to, to allow God to work, to work in and to work things out. And then I'm able to say, okay, God, thank you for revealing that within myself. Now, please, if you want to use, if I, I would love to be the one to minister to this person, but if I'm not the one, send somebody to him. May your word not come back void. May you, um, work in their life. You can't chain God. He's 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 too powerful for our finite minds to chain. His word it it accomplishes what it sets out to accomplish, and so I want to focus and remember that, and that helps me deal with those moments where I'm like, oh man, I should have said this, because God can re can can work in a way and say the things that need to be said even better than I can say them. And, and so um, that's one thing for me that, that helps. That was a long answer. I apologize. But, uh, no, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, I see Brother Kirk and Mr. Emmanuel. Uh, just quickly, Daniel. Uh, Emmanuel's asking a question that really is good. Uh, write an article, Emmanuel, about angels or prayer or something just write a little paper and keep several copies with you fold them up like a little booklet or a tract or something like that and when you get into a conversation with somebody if they're christians or even if they're not christians hey why don't you read this and and then if, if you want to talk about it sometime i'd love to talk to you about it just open yourself up make sure you put your phone number on there i know that that's scary sometimes but god will be with you write write something very very personal i give people a copy of a book on prayer that i've tried to write and it's for, it's not because i'm an expert in prayer it's because i i needed to write it but i can give that to them and and then say hey call me here's my phone number i'd love to talk to you let's study sometime that kind of thing and and they'll and, and before you know it, you'll be studying the Bible with more people than you can, as my daddy used to say, shake a stick at. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Um, Stephen, go ahead. And, um, everything was wonderfully said. One of the things I would like to comment on is, see, sometimes I think we put burdens on ourselves as well when we have uh, walked away drove away whatever we do and we feel that we should have said like you said earlier we should have said something different and and we have to remember we're in the spiritual warfare 
So when we think that Satan will come in and put that on our on our mind that we didn't do enough. And I just I'm a real big believer in the evidence of the Bible, how Jesus was in at every bedside healing. And we have uh, 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 stories of where he just spoke uh, the uh, um, the soldier's daughter was sick or the servant was sick and Jesus wasn't even there, but the, the servant believed. So uh, when sometimes when I feel that uh, I haven't done enough, I have to, I step back and I just say, you know, uh, God has a way of speaking to that person. That's that time for that person uh, to say, you know, God forgive me. And, and, and so we have to believe and trust that God didn't stop uh, 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 in his heart, what we're doing is continue to plant the seed or we come behind and, and water it, like you said. But I think sometimes we have to watch that we're not putting burdens on us on, to, help, to weigh us down because we're in a spiritual warfare. And I just wanted to say that. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, he, he continues on. Um, Paul does, as you get into uh, to verse seven, he tells him, reflect. Reflect on what I'm saying, um, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. Um, it's, it's like he's saying the meaning will become clear to you. You'll be, uh, you'll be able to willingly choose the road that God has laid out for you. You're going to find. I, I, I love the um, kind of the irony of the Bible, if you will. Um, it's probably not the right the right word that I'm thinking of, but you lose your life. Uh, you lose your life and you find it. You be first. Uh, if you want to be first, be last. Those um, you, you want to be a, a great leader, learn to be a servant. These, these um, seem so backward, if you will. But Paul um, tells Timothy, reflect on what he's saying. He's telling Timothy, reflect on what I'm saying, and the Lord will give you insight in this. Students of, of Scripture, and that should be all of us. If we are, if we if we call ourselves Christian, we should all be students of Scripture. All right. And I'm talking about SHBI students or or you go to a Bible college, but we are all, every one of us, if we call ourselves Christian, should be students of Scripture. And we must consider God's word carefully in order to understand it. Students of scripture should, should study with this promise in mind that the Lord will give you understanding. But don't be lazy with your Bible study. Don't work hard at it. Believe that God's going to help you uncover the truth that he has for you. Work hard and stay humble. We've, we've, we've got We've got to be about working it. Paul used all of those uh, illustrations that we talked about earlier, um, and they could probably be applied to our to our study of of uh, scripture as well. In verses eight and nine, Paul reminds Timothy of the motive for suffering hardship. He tells him, "Remember Jesus Christ, uh, raised from the dead, descended from David. Jesus, uh, Jesus is our model. He's the example in every aspect of the Christian life." Um, love for Jesus controls us. It motivates us. It compels us. We love Jesus because he first loved us. When we were still sinners, he died for us. We do these things because Jesus was willing to suffer for us. We not only suffer um, for Christ because we love him, but we suffer in service because of who he is. Jesus is the Christ. He's the anointed one. He's God's promised king. Jesus' resurrection says he's truly divine. His, uh, his, um, whenever he talks about um, David, it's showing that he's also human. He is, he is the one, the perfect, uh, the perfect sacrifice. He's fully divine, fully man. Both are important. Jesus, uh, is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. That's foretold by the prophets. He arose from the dead. He is the heir of David's throne. Paul's gospel in summary. This is my gospel, he says, for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. He's suffering just as Jesus suffered. 
Paul's second imprisonment is different from, from his first. We've talked about that a little bit. Um, he wasn't necessarily treated criminally in those other ones. I mean, he was, but but not to this extent. But God's word is not chained. Paul's behind prison doors, but God can open a door for his message. Paul's willingness to suffer prison and death for the gospel made his gospel even more believable to those that hear it. Endure to the end. Through the good seasons, through the difficult ones, keep your attention, keep your focus on Jesus. Christ should be the central and preeminent in our ministry. He's, he's the focal point. He's the reason. Jesus died in our place for our sins. He rose from the grave. He conquered the enemies. He sits at the Father's right hand. When your tank's empty, <laughs> when your tank's empty, remember that so is the tomb. And that the throne is occupied. A high view, having a high view of Christ keeps us in the game. It keeps us in the fight. And it keeps us on the farm working. I loved when Paul says um, he may be in chains, but God's word is not chained. See, you might be able to, to make me be quiet, but you can't silence God's word. You can put me to death, but God's word is living and active. His word prevails. Nothing can hold it back. It brings transformation. We might suffer, but we suffer not in vain. God's word is powerful. And I love when he says that I am in chains, but God's word is not chained. And then he goes on in verse, uh, beginning in verse 10, therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, for the chosen, that they too may obtain the salvation that's in Christ with eternal glory. He wanted to suffer fully as Jesus did because it, it meant that more souls could be saved. And Timothy should also be willing to do that. When ministry is difficult, we've got to remember that we do, that Christ's love compels us. That, that we are suffering, the, the sufferings that we do, it's worth it. Because God's word, um, God is, is, is going gonna, is gonna to bring about, and it's him. Right. It's not us. It's, it's not just that we suffer, but God is going to bring about change in people's lives. And that's worth suffering for. When when someone comes to Christ and I had to suffer a little bit for it, that's worth it. Christ suffered for us. And in verse 11, he, he does his um his trustworthy saying, here is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, he will. Uh, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. This is one of of five trustworthy sayings in the in the pastoral letters. Um, we. There's one in Titus, this one in 2 Timothy, three in 1 Timothy. And these, uh, these statements were, were typically, they, they seemed like they would be easy to memorize. They were probably passed around from, from church to church. They were said among the Christians. Um, and this one is, is pretty poetic. Um, it, it may have been a fragment from an early, from an early hymn. And it consists of two pairs of sayings, which are general truths about the Christian's life. That The first pair relates to those who endure faithfully, and the second pair describes those that are unfaithful. If we die with him, we will also live with him. Now that's, um, you know, Jesus said, anybody who doesn't take up their cross and follow me. We've, we've got to take up a cross and follow. We died to self. And so that first prayer, if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. 
But then verse 13, if we are faithless, he will remain faithful for he cannot disown himself. God cannot lie. He is perfectly faithful. He cannot deny his own promises. Now, some take this. Uh, I don't know how much to go into this, but some take this verse, it was verse 13, uh, and they, they say that it refers to the idea that even if we turn away from Jesus, he will not turn away from us. And others um, say it means that if we are unfaithful, he remains faithful to his own character, which in this case would include rejecting the faithless. So one group would see that as a word of comfort and the and the. If you have the second interpretation of it, you would see it as a word of warning. But what we can see in here is that God will not deny himself. He cannot act contrary to his nature. He is faithful. He is the God of mercy and justice. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. And Paul says, you remember Jesus. Remember Jesus Christ. Remember the one who, who conquered the enemy who conquered our enemies, and he's seated at the Father's right hand. He gives sufficient grace so we can endure hardship. If we endure with him, we will reign with him. And when we hear him say, well done, then we will not regret suffering for the gospel as a good soldier, as a disciplined athlete, as a hardworking farmer. All right, so we've got we're we're running um, kind of low on time, if you will, but this has been great discussion. I'm going to go ahead and, and read um, 14 through the end, and we'll we'll talk about it as much as we can. Um, verse 14: Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is no it is of no value, and it only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hermanius and Philetus, and they have departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place, and they destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, still sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his. Everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. In a large house, there are articles of articles, not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and some are for common use. Those who cleanse themselves for them, the latter will be instruments for special purposes made holy useful to the master and prepared to do any good work. Flee evil desires of youth, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on, an, on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful, Opponents must be gently instructed and hope that God will grant them to a knowledge, um, will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. And they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. All right. That was a, a, a lot right there. Like I said, this um, this has a lot of um, a lot of content in this chapter. But Paul advises Timothy to. To be a workman approved by God. Do your best. Um, you, you may have learned it. Study to show thyself approved. That, that idea of, of being diligent. Doing your best. Keep reminding them. The preachers to whom you are entrusting the gospel of these things. Of the need to be faithful. To endure suffering for Christ and his people. Of the difference between sound teaching in, in, in vain and vanity. Um, warn them before God against quarreling. The will of God is generally understood through principles, not hair splitting. I like, I like that phrase. It's of no value and it ruins those who listen. 
Our divisions may deny the very gospel that we preach. Fighting and, and quarreling over, over something that is of no significance. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly handles the word of truth. Paul um, uses a few, <clears throat> excuse me, a few phrases here. He, he uses that the the idea of, of be a be a workman who is not ashamed. So an unashamed workman. That um, he talks about that in verses fifteen through nineteen. Um, and then he's going to talk about uh, the vessel, be a clean vessel, a, a vessel set apart for an honorable purpose, a holy purpose, a noble purpose. And then um, that's uh, that goes through verse 22. And then in verse 23, he talks about being a servant of, of the Lord. So the, the unashamed workmen... And again, you may have heard it as studying. Studying is a part, I believe, of, of obeying this verse, but it means to try hard in all parts of ministry, to be a good worker who will please the Lord. Um, do your best. Do your best. We who are God's workers must present ourselves to God. We're accountable to him, and we aim to please him, to be unashamed, unashamedly working for him, um, correctly handling the word of truth, or rightly dividing the word of truth. We're not. Um, our intent is not to to misuse scripture to make it say what we want. Some, uh, I've seen, I've seen that happen, and it's sad, where we uh, we twist. Where, where people will twist scripture to, to accommodate their sin. Um, we are to rightly divide the word of truth, rightly handle it. Uh, he tells them to avoid godless chatter. Um, he says that um, this, their, their teaching, their false teaching will spread like gangrene. Um, in our in our notes that that brother B wrote, he said, um, "If I treat my opinion as a matter of fundamental gospel truth, I divide the church unnecessarily. And if I treat fundamental truth as though it were a matter of opinion, then I undermine the gospel. We have a high calling to do our best." And we also have a high calling to rightly divide the word of truth, to handle the word of truth, to rightly handle the word of truth. And God's foundation stands firm. There's a lot of stuff in um, in that inscription. Um, We uh, we are called. I, let me let me read this one more time to us because it's it's so it's so crucial. Um, <clears throat> Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Um, one way that we handle the word of truth is we avoid godless chatter. We stand on the firm foundation. It says, the Lord knows, um, in this inscription, this is verse 19. This is what I was trying to get to. There's two inscriptions here where he says, the Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. Um, that that refers to, to numbers where... We see Kor's rebellion where they're coming against Moses and, and Aaron, and they're like, "What makes you so special?" and and they're they're rebelling. The Lord knows those who are His. 
we are called to rightly handle that word. We are called to, um, Timothy's called and, 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 and we are called to do our best. To present ourselves to God as one approved, a workman rightly handling the word of truth. It's a high calling. And it's not one that we should take lightly. And then he talks about um, the vessels, how some are used for noble reasons and some for ignoble reasons or honorable reasons and, and some for dishonorable. And he tells us to cleanse ourselves, to be cleansed from, from the moral filth, basically. The, and he tells us to, uh, tells Timothy, flee the desires of the youth, pursue righteousness. So it's not just a, a fleeing our, our evil desires, but to pursue something. Um, it's important that I flee sin. Uh, sometimes that's the best response. Run, run away from sin, but run toward, pursue. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who called the Lord out of a pure heart. So I'm fleeing from, from sinful desires. I'm fleeing from the youthful desires, from, and I'm pursuing something. I, I, I kind of love that, that imagery because it, to me, it shows like this, um, for one, repentance, because I'm, I'm turning away, turning away from something and going after something, turning away from what I was doing, and I'm pursuing righteousness. I'm pursuing faith. And, and I just, I, I love that, that imagery. I love the imagery that, that Paul gives here. He's, he's got all these illustrations, and it makes it all just kind of, you can see it. See it in your mind. You 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 can see the the soldier. You can see the farmer. You can you can see the athlete. Um, here you can see the person fleeing something and and running toward what is right. Running towards faithfulness and and righteousness. And then he says to be a servant. Don't have anything to do with foolish or stupid arguments because you know that they produce quarrels and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. But must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. We've got we've got a high calling. So if we were to. To sum this all up. Because it's about that time to do so. What I would what I would see here and that I would pass on to you. We're all you're all in this class. We're in this class because we we want to learn. We want to grow in knowledge. We we want to um, to be the best that we can be. Do your best. Work hard and trust. And trust what God's given you. Trust. Disciple. Build up. Others that are going to to carry on, that are going to carry the torch. Invest in people. These are these are things that are so important, and they take they take work, they take hard work, and they take dedication, and it takes discipline, and it takes focus. And I'll admit, it's easy sometimes to lose our focus to get distracted. But that's why we've got to have the discipline to focus, to do our best to present ourselves to God as one approved. Now, look, none of this, I mean, these, these sound like, like some strict orders, and they are. But none of this is to earn your salvation. That's a gift. That's a, that's a gift that, that we can't earn. We can't possibly do enough. And, and so... Um, the, the danger in, in emphasizing some of the things that I've emphasized today is that you would look at it and you would say, well, I just got to work harder 
and and God will be more proud of me or or God will accept me more or God will love me more or or then I'll finally be saved. No, that's a gift. But because because he's he's called us out of out of darkness and into light. Then I want to be about bringing others out of that darkness and into his marvelous light. We want to be people that that pursue righteousness, that that flee immorality, that flee sin and chase after God, that flee that flee evil and pursue righteousness. And that's going to take some training. That's going to take some discipline. That's going to take some hard work, and, and it's not always glamorous. And it's not, you won't often hear the applause of men, but we're not working for their applause, are we? We want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what we're about. Any final thoughts? Um, I'm over time again. I always do that. Any final thoughts? I I appreciate those of you that have um, been here that are that have that have shared. Keep keep praying. Pray for one another. Um, pray for each other, and and because we've. Um, we have a burden. We we have a burden to to share this gospel, to entrust it to others, and and because we have that desire, because we have that command, we're going to face adversity, and we're going to have suffering. And let's pray that we that we all endure hardship as a faithful servant that we endure the suffering. So let's uh let's pray and then we'll we'll close out. Lord, thank you. I thank you for each uh each person that's in this uh, those that are participating live, those that may see it later. You've given us a a beautiful task. May we not take it lightly. God, may we be faithful and reliable with the message that you've entrusted to us. And may we in turn entrust it to others that will, that will be able to, to teach it and, and entrust it to others. May, may it go on and on something that outlives us. God, give us the, the discipline, the focus, the hard work, to drive the motivation, to finish strong, to endure hardship, to withstand the suffering. For our suffering is, is momentary and it compares. Uh, it's nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed to us. Thank you. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, for your justice. We thank you. We praise you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Daniel. Good night. Uh, Daniel, good night. one of the good best, brother. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks for a blessed message.